welcome everybody. Uh, lovely to see you all again, quite a lot of you this time. Uh, our chairman, Robin Skagel, uh, won't be here tonight, uh, so I am chairing the meeting tonight. Uh, I have a little bit of sad news to report, first of all. One of our members, sadly, has died. Uh, Noel Anderson died on the 19th of October. Uh, he wasn't a member for very long, but he came to some meetings, and many of you met him. He was uh, a, a particularly a friend of Colin Kite, who also can't be here this evening. So, just take a few moments uh, to those who knew Noel to remember him. He was much liked by everybody who met him, and uh, his, uh, Colin attended the funeral uh, last Friday, and apparently Noel was very well thought of in the Catholic community in West London. So I have a, a quick moment of silence. Thank you very much. So, this is the first occasion that we have had an external speaker to Wallace since we have started having live meetings again three months ago. Uh, this is Slavoj Naj, and he is very local. He lives very local, although he started his life in Hungary. He lives, actually, strangely enough, only walking distance from this meeting place in South Harrow. And he is an amateur astronomer who's made a big name for himself for his interest in uh, space and the, um, for the things that are in orbit around the Earth and showing people, showing the general public uh, what we can see in orbit around the Earth and what we can see further out in space. He's, uh, uh, I met him at first at the Baker Street Irregular Astronomers and he's very keen on outreach work. And he's got a, a website, I think it's a, a YouTube channel, I can't remember now, but it's in Hungarian, which is um, really big uh, in uh, telling Hungarians about uh, space-related uh, matters. And uh, that's, uh, it's, it's become a big occupation for him, although he only started on astronomy a few years ago, uh, and it was a BBC TV programme. But uh, got an interesting first of all. So, uh, uh, Subosh is going to talk to us tonight about uh, his work taking pictures of the International Space Station and maybe other things as well. We will see. Thank you very much. Anyway, in the meantime, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for for the welcome. And thanks for the invitation. I, I, I haven't done this for a while. <laughs> Mostly due to the COVID situation. And let's hope that we are free and, and we're going to meet more often in the future. Um, as David was saying, yes, I got into astronomy photography in 2013. Thanks for the great BBC services. And Professor Brian Cox, he sort of he made a couple of brilliant programs, and uh, and I bought my first telescope, and it it all started with astronomy, <laughs> as uh, as we know it's a beautiful hobby, and uh, and yes, this talk of mine is gonna be about my journey, uh, about how to take photos of the International Space Station. Um, it's not an easy task, but definitely nothing that nothing impossible in it. With a bit of practice, I think anybody can can achieve um, similar results. Um, all right. Uh, so I've got a video, but I try to. Ah, it will have a sound. This is just a general general um, footage about the International Space Station. Um, I have to say that till about 2014, I did not know anything anything about the International Space Station at all. And 
And it was a kind of a surprise to me when I realized that there is such thing above us. It's been permanently habited um, since 2000, yes, with the Expedition 1 went up um, three astronauts, what, two cosmonauts and one astronaut. And it's a, it's a science laboratory. It does amazing thing for us to understand the universe, um, understand our surroundings, and, and just, just to discover our Earth. I think that's probably one of the, the key things about the International Space Station and what it opens up these days. Um, is just we are humans and we are explorers and I think we sometimes forget that how important to to look down on our planet um, the COP26 is ongoing as we know climate crisis is, is on and I think um, the International Space Station and in, in general space travel going to help us tackle this issue and, ma and make people understand that this is a beautiful planet we are living in and how fragile it is. Um, we need to look after it pretty well. And I think what the, the, the amount of science they conduct on the International Space Station takes the human knowledge further. We understand more about physics, about chemistry, about biology, about a lot of, lot of things that's crucial for our species to actually grow and and proceed. So this is the international space. If somebody, if somebody haven't seen it before, that's it. So that's an orbital laboratory. It's huge. It's about 109 meters wide and 50 odd meters. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, um, the dimensions uh, are this much. And it's oops, and I managed to. I'm sorry for that. So. Yes, so this is a, a, a large, basically it's a, it's a large spacecraft, to put it simple. Um, that's where the, the astronauts live. At, that, that, that there have always been at least two people up there, one from the American and one from the Russian side. And uh, that's basically, it serves as a laboratory. They, do, um, they are in microgravity and it's, uh, it's a space environment search laboratory. Um, where we do all kinds of experiments uh, in biology, in human biology, physics, astronomy, meteorology, uh, and Earth observations. Um, I think a lot of people, especially if I look around, I think uh, a lot of people were growing up uh, maybe at the end of the Apollo era, beginning of the space shuttle era, and a lot of people I know are thinking that we probably wasted some time spending lots of money on space shuttle program, the um, space transport system or the STS program, and uh, and and instead of going to other planets and explore. But basically, the the space shuttle program opened up the possibility of building the International Space Station, and I think we did not waste our time. We probably spend some time on reflecting on ourselves. Having that laboratory made us understand a lot of things. Um, the f expedition one, three three persons were up there: William Shepard, uh, Yuri Gidzenko, and Sergei Krikayev. And this is what the early International Space Station looked like. Um, it's a little bit of a cheat because this is the Zvezda module and that was not part of the original space station. We call it the birth of the space station when the Unity module and the Zarya module were docked together. That's when the ISS was born. So this is the first crew in the middle, the American astronaut and on the two uh, sides, the two Russian cosmonaut. And this is how large it grew over the time. You can see that lots of additional parts were added you can see now the Unity and the Zarya and the Zvezda module I was mentioning just a moment ago. And also they added, uh, with the space shuttle, they added uh, um, a Columbus module, that's a European uh, module, a hard, is that right? Sorry, we yep. are only on the 
אוקיי. יאללה יאללה, תקשיב. So I need to change the screen. Okay, so stop share. Okay, no problem. They can't see it. Yeah, that looks better. That's okay now. I think. Well, hang on. We'll do our best for the Zoom watchers, but we will give you priority. Okay. If I put it on large screen, is that still all right? Yeah, that's fine. That's, okay. That's Thank good you. now, I think. Yes, yes, that's fine. Thank you. No problems. So they added a uh, European module called the Columbus module, Harmony module, American, Kibo, it's a Japanese module, and Destiny. Also, you can see that there are radiators on the ISS. These are um, thermal regulators, basically. It's, it's all controlling the, the cold and the heat uh, the ISS is, is exposed to. Also, the large solar arrays, these are probably the biggest features or or the most remarkable features on the International Space Station. We just got a little upgrade lately, but I will talk about it a little bit later. Um, this is a fresh a photograph about the International Space Station, and what's exciting about it is this bit. They just added some new solar panels onto it, and for my biggest joy, it's photographable. So you will see on my photographs and animations that you can spot it. This is just the beginning of the upgrade. They will have another pair going onto this side and there will be one half here and another half will be added. So basically these are totally new solar panels and they are just really efficient, really, really efficient despite its smaller size. It gives you an idea how big the international space, it is huge. Let's be, let's add that. Let's add that. Uh, it's, it's, it's massive. It's the, by far the largest and the most expensive thing humans ever built. So some interesting fact. A lot of people think that in microgravity, so when the, when the astronauts are up there, they are in microgravity, so there is no gravity. But that's wrong. Actually, 90% uh, of the gravitational force of Earth is still vivid, still um, in action. But because they are going really fast around the Earth, that basically it cancels the falling. So, sorry, they try to break out from the orbit of the Earth, but the gravity pulls them back. So there's a kind of an equi equilibrium, and it and it and they can stay up on the orbit. Um, some fun facts. Um, probably it's interesting to note this bottom information there. Basically, it says that every month the ISS is losing about 400 meters of its altitude uh, simply because it's high up, it's around 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, but uh, in the same time, it's still some atmosphere in that, in that altitude, and slowly that drag is slowing down the ISS. So every now and then they need to do an, an orbital correction, basically, to put it back up to... 400, uh, 400 kilometers. Um, very interesting to note that we learned a lot about the effect on the human body of being in space, basically. Um, it's, it's affecting our the bone density, uh, muscles weakens, um, they need to do workouts every day, two, three hours, because otherwise they couldn't stand up after six months. And your heart gets weakened, and we are realizing that living in microgravity is fun, that's for sure, but that's really bad for the human body or any living organism. Um, also, they were doing some experiments. They were exposing some microorganisms outside the International Space Station, and that proved the end of the experiment, they realized that some of these organisms can survive the harsh environment of space, the, the radiation, the vacuum, uh, the, the cold outside. So that made it possible that life could have traveled to Earth and then spread instead of evolving on planet Earth. 
Also, they do all kinds of medical researches. They're growing um, protein crystals, and they use it for medical researches. Also, they have the so-called alpha magnetic spectrometer, and that's basically helping us to understand the universe. Um, we are looking for dark matter. And, uh, and that's definitely giving us a totally new view on, on, on the universe as we know. That's the AMS, actually, just right there. Um, also, combustion. Flame acts differently in microgravity. You can see instead of this elongated shape, it's more like a bubble. It's very interesting. It's actually sometimes when there is something burning on the ISS or in microgravity, you can't see it. That's why it's so dangerous. It, flame acts totally differently in microgravity. So what brought me into ISS photography? Because people don't just do this. I know because I, I have to search the internet to find like-minded people who are doing the same um, hobby as I do. Um, there's one prominent um, photographer amongst us, Martin Lewis, and we have amazing cooperation every now and then to take photographs. So what, what brought me into this astronomy photography or astronomy in general? Um, I remember I was just telling to David before, before we came that I was just watching uh, Stargazing Live, if you remember, with Dara O'Brien and uh, Brian Cox, and they were showing Jupiter live in that program. And then when I saw it, I said, I'll, I need to buy a telescope, and I need to see this myself, because it's utterly beautiful. So I bought my telescope, and then I realized on the internet that there are some photos of this thing called the ISS, not mistaken with the terrorist group. Um, and then and then I just started doing my research, and then I realized that you, you need a telescope and a camera, and you can actually take a photograph of it. You can even see it with by a naked eye, if you know exactly when to go out, and which direction of the sky uh, to look. So I took my first photo, um, I don't know what what shape does it give you. Um, I always show this because I cannot unsee anymore the skiing rabbit. This is the ski, and this is the ears of the rabbit, and it's really flying now. So it's kind of a fun photograph. I never took anything similar. Somehow the the solar panels were aligned in a funny way, but it's always a, a nice anecdote to, to mention. Um, Yes, um, it, is, it is fascinating because what it does, basically, it brings you close, this object and everything, what, what, what it is about, basically. Um, I think we all have this feeling sometimes that, that we see things and you, you don't have your connection with it. I think some, some ways astrophotography serves this purpose, that, that you find a target and when you photograph it, you start learning about it. Your interest is, is already awakened and you want to know more. Okay, what is it? How far is it? How big it is? So on and so forth. ISS, it was the same to me. More I photographed it, more I wanted to learn about it. Who's up there? What kind of things are they doing? Um, when new spacecrafts are going on to the ISS and things like that. If you want to observe the ISS, you need to know that it has a, a periodic occurrence. So let's say from here, from London, we can see it for about two, two three weeks, let's say in the evenings, and then it disappears for weeks, and then it reappears in the morning sky, and then disappears again and reappears in the evening sky again. In summers, when the, when the nights, sorry, when, yeah, when the nights are shorter, Sometimes we have three, four flybys during a, a, an, an evening. So it's, it's, it's always good to know the dynamics of the ISS observations. So why do we see the ISS? Or in general, why do we see uh, satellites? Um, it's mainly because, let's say we are somewhere here, and we are observing the ISS, and because it's high enough, it's 400 kilometers above the Earth. The sun can still reach it, and it reflects the sunlight. So that's why it's usually after sunset or before sunrise. 
hour, hour and a half, two hours before these uh, sunrise or sunset can be observed. And that's basically the reason why we can see the ISS or any satellites in the sky. Um, right, the equipment. <clears throat> All the photos you're going to see was taken with a 10-inch Dobsonian telescope. I always say to, to people who are who are interested in, in taking photos of the ISS that, that a Dobsonian telescope is probably the best equipment for that. It's because um, you need to grab it. You need to get hold of it, and that's how you can find control by manually moving the telescope uh, to track the ISS. I usually started, so before I, I, I really got into it, I practiced on, on just aircrafts, daytime. I just put my DSLR on, and I was just practicing how to actually, how to track things in the sky. And, and it's really not a, a huge challenge, I have to say. Um, it's just a bit of practice, basically. So that's my equipment. I have an, an EQ platform underneath, but it's because I've done some other observations. But th this is what it looks like. It's a flex tube, a sky watcher, uh, 250, um, so a 10-inch Dobsonian telescope, and also I just brought some of the um, some of the accessories. So I always take photos with an ASI 224 MC camera, so that's a color camera, which can do 100 frames per second at its best, which is perfect for for this, and, the, and it, it has a really good sensitivity. Also. The focal length of this telescope is 1,200 millimeters, and I bought a Teleview two and a half times focal extender. It's a it's a PowerMate, and I I can recommend. This is by far one of the best and affordable um, piece or accessory that help you give superb quality photographs. Um, also, I use a Telrad. I don't know if you are familiar with a Telrad. If you are not, it's basically, this is what it looks like. And if I turn it on, there are some concentric circles here projected onto this plate. So there's no magnification at all. You just look through and it's basically giving you, it's like an army um, aim uh, device for, for rifles, I think. Similar to that, I guess that's where the idea is from. So, and that's it. Before I start imaging, I just, I just, uh, before I exit, I just, uh, what I do is I align the, um, the main scope with the tail rod as accurately as possible before I insert the focal extender. And I do the same thing once the focal extender is, um, added to the equation, and then I use a Barlow, uh, sorry, um, Bobinov mask, that's what I wanted to say, um, for focusing, and once you, you set everything, you don't touch any settings. So it's all fixed, if you messed it up, then <laughs> you messed it up, there is no way for correction. That's, that's probably one of those things that I think makes ISS photography partially really hard camera settings on the way, on the go. Once you set it, and if you, if, if you nailed it, then you have a good chance of gaining good uh, photographs. Um, usually it's, 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 it's a fascinating um, and very rapid event. So it's not like planetary photography, let's say, that we all set up and we wait for the planet. Clouds can come and go, we wait for it, that's fine, no. With the ISS flyby, <clears throat> it depends on how, what's the elevation of the flyby, but it happens tops five minutes. And you can, you can use the best, I would say, three and a half, four minutes <coughs> of a flyby, when it's obviously the highest. Same rule applies then with planetary or any photo, astrophotography. Lower it is in the sky, more you are looking into the atmosphere, further the ISS is from you, so it's no point. After, I think, certain experience, you don't really wait. Um, so, so you don't start the imaging when it's really low. You wait until 40, 45, 50 
degrees, and that's when you can gain uh, the most. Um, and I will just mention a couple of uh, stories because I want my photographs speak for themselves. But I will just tell you some of the stories, some of my best images. Uh, one of them was uh, the first Space Screw Dragon um, spacecraft going onto the, the ISS. So it was unmanned, and that was the first time that the spacecraft visited the International Space Station. And I think so far, as far as I know, um, I'm the only one who managed to take a photo. I don't know why nobody photographed, but luckily um, I managed to, to pull off a photograph. So this is me setting up my equipment. You can see the clouds coming and going. This was one of the lesser good um, as well. But you, you did see me sort of moving uh, my telescope. That's my method, basically. And, and this is the ISS, and you can see this is... Yeah, my mouse is there. So this is the Crew Dragon spacecraft. You can see it is getting closer as 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 the flyby proceeds. Basically, the orientation changes. It's a little bit like when an aircraft is approaching, and you can see as it, it's in the distance. You can see the front of it. When it's above you, you can see the belly of it, and then as it goes away, basically you can see the the rear of it. So clearly, you can see. This is the Crew Dragon, basically. And then I was just checking the live feed, and I could see this is the Conador. This is a robotic arm that Canada gave to this whole project. And I could uh, identify it on, on the live uh, stream, basically, later on. Here's another photo. This is the, the other mission. This is demo to mission, so this was already with two humans on board. And this is the Canada arm again. Um, it's pretty cool that even with a 10 inch telescope, you can, you can do such resolutions. And this is the onboard um, photo. Sorry, I'm keep, <laughs> I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, and this is the Canada arm, basically. So sometimes you can identify uh, these little elements on the ISS, basically. Um, through the live um, a broadcast on NASA TV. This story has something to do with Martin Lewis because there were a few of us who wanted to photograph this event. Uh, I realized that on the um, 50th anniversary of the moon landing, there was a, a Soyuz spacecraft going, going, going on to, into the International Space Station. and. We did some calculations, and it turned out that we could see it on the first revolution. So when it passed the sky first, you could see the ISS, and then the Soyuz just a little bit behind it. And then they went around. 92 minutes later, we didn't see two lights. We only saw one. So we started imaging myself in Wimbledon, where I lived in that time. Did I? Yeah, I pulled it out. Sorry. And uh, and and a, and a third person called uh, Nicholas. Uh, he was imaging from his home as well. And this is the crew on board. And then when I looked back the photographs, I realized that that's the Soyuz spacecraft down there. They were 67 meters away from the International Space Station, and they were on approach. So they were they were getting closer. They were docking to the to the to the Zvezda module, which is this one, which was which was luck for us because if they dock from underneath, then maybe it just blends into the International Space Station. But because they were docking to the end, the aft docking port of the Zvezda module, perfectly they just lined up for us. Um, there will be some more photographs about the same event. This is a little bit later. Uh, the solar panels are not, were not visible anymore. And this is the setup. So basically that's where they docked, this Soyuz spacecraft. And this is Martin's photograph, which was brilliant again. He captured it extremely well. And also this is Nicolas, Nicolas's um, shot. He didn't catch it then. 
but he waited one more revolution and then he captured the ISS with the already dogged MS-13 Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station. That created this whole story. It's amazing how you can see the dynamics of, of how the crews come in and going, the, the cargo supplies come in and going to the ISS, and I can tell you I've been waiting for a moment like this for a long time. And actually have, and even like this, you have a nice flyby as well, and the sky is clear. <laughs> That's kind of almost mission impossible, but luckily I think the, the weather got right on that evening. Starling constellation. I think this is something that a lot of us really don't like, or I can go even further, really hate the Starling satellites. Um, I always try to approach this question as, as a photographer, because I wanted to see if I can take photographs of it. And again, with Martin, we had a cooperation. Together, we photographed. So this is the second stage of a Falcon 9 rocket, and this is a so-called uh, double chain. So you can't see because, because they are sort of as they were getting further and further away. Um, they sort of blended into one line, but before that, you can now see this is basically 30 and 30 satellites. We are about seven minutes after they separated from the second stage, and they and in the SpaceX uh, streams, they always say it like they act like a deck of cards. So when they separate, they just unfold basically by the force of the separation. And that's what we captured with Martin, which was an amazing, amazing, despite what it's gonna do to our night sky, still, photographically, it's an extremely challenging thing. Tension rods are the things that keeps these satellites in place whilst they are attached to the second stage. And we both uh, photographed the tension rods the second stage and all the 60 satellites. We actually counted them. <laughs> it looks like a hedgehog. I can't, de and I I can't deny it. Um, but it was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, experience photographically. It was really low and it's flying really fast because it's only half as, as uh, high above the ground than the ISS with the, traveling with the same velocity. I had another occasion when I photographed the satellite before separation. So what we see here is this is the second stage and this is the stack of the satellites as they are approaching and obviously the top is reflecting a lot of sunlight. For some reason it doesn't play the animations. I don't know why. This is one Starlink satellite. I, I would like to emphasize this is with a 10-inch telescope. You don't need a C-14. For this. This is a 10 inch telescope manually moved like this. So it is really capable from London and I would urge everybody if you want you can photograph this kind of object. This is another photo of a, of a Starlink satellite. You can see it's completely um, unfolded and there's another one And it's just brilliant, really. I, 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 can't, I, can't, I don't know why, but my, my computer doesn't play the animation, which is a big, uh, it's not a good thing, because uh, these are, these, these meant to move, and this is not going to give me back now um, the same feeling it's supposed to. Shall I take a quick look? Um, I'm sorry for that. We have some technical problems. Probably if I just show it like that, sorry for the, um, it's not that professional but at least you can see what I mean. Um, so that's the ISS, and on that shot, you can see a Soyuz spacecraft on the zenith side. So the ISS, as it travels around the Earth, it has a nadir side, which always faces to the Earth, and there's a zenith side, which always faces to, to the space. And first time I realized that if if the ISS is at certain angle, sorry, at certain elevation, then it means that you are not looking up 
basically up onto it, but you're looking basically a little bit from a side, and it means that you can see whatever on the Zenith side. This was kind of a, a, a surprise I didn't expect. Also why I love animations is because suddenly the photos, they come alive. It, it shows you so much more than just one still photograph. That's why very useful to have a high frame rate camera. Because as you move your telescope, what basically I'm trying to do is keeping the ISS in my field of view. If you would see any of my recordings, the ISS just, just zooms in for seconds and it just goes all over the screen. But because I'm recording it in a, with a high frame rate camera, it means that I maximize the chance to grab as many sharp frames as possible. And if my tracking is really good, that it means that I can have consecutive frames and then I can just suddenly create things like this. This is, you can clearly see solar panels, you can see the little modules, you can even see the dog spacecraft to it, which is, I think, fantastic. That's, for instance, the Dragon spacecraft that since has been retired. This is the first generation and since they changed it to the second. Um, this is probably the last photograph uh, of the last um, Dragon One, Dragon One spacecraft docked. Also, I was experimenting a little bit. Uh, this is the new uh, Crew Dragon, and I was experimenting a little bit with AI. I know it's uh, a lot of people probably think it's, it's really bad, but for some reason. Uh, some of the cases with ISS, it works perfectly because I think some people try to use it for planetary photography, but the problem with, with, with using it for planetary photography is that it might create um, certain details that's never been there. But with ISS photography, it's perfect to get rid of, of, of the noise and without adding anything that originally was not there. And I was mentioning these new solar panels, they call the iRosa solar panels. And you can clearly see as they are 10 degrees tilted and put on the old ones. And in certain angles, sometimes you see they are looking inwards. And on some of the videos you see here, they look outwards. Also, you might notice that out of the four solar panels, two is missing. Um, well, it's not missing at all. It's just probably faintly here you can see right there. It's there, but they turn it around because the ISS can be in a so-called high beta angle season. It means, I will show you, uh, I think I have an animation about it and I will point it out when, it, when we get there. Basically what happens that there are certain times, certain periods in a year when the ISS, uh, as you look, look at the sun from the ISS's point of view, it never goes below the horizon. So it's never blocked by, by the Earth. So it means the ISS never entered, enters Earth's shadow. So it's constantly illuminated by the sun. The ISS is not made for these purposes. The ISS has a thermal control system and it's all designed to be sometimes in, in the illuminated side of the Earth and sometimes in the shadow, Earth shadow. So um, therefore, when, when the ISS enters this, this period, then basically they need to do some level, level of, um, so, uh, once they shade the ISS, so these panels, they cast a shadow onto other parts of the ISS, and also they avoid basically um, overheating. It's very important because it's a, it's a very, very, very complex system. This is the animation I was, I was telling you. You will see that the sun is getting lower, closer to Earth, but it never goes behind the Earth, so therefore the ISS is constantly illuminated, and that's why they need to tackle this kind of overheating issue. Some experiments with mono cameras, also with higher focal length, 
but sometimes it's more focal length you apply, obviously you'll have less chance to actually keep it in your field of view. Um, sometimes I try to tame the ISS, <laughs> uh, sometimes I managed, um, but the, just the photography of it is, is, is incredibly good. Um, also, I managed to take photos of all four different cargo spacecrafts that goes to the International Space Station. We're talking about a bus size object here, traveling between three and four hundred uh, kilometers above the Earth with more than 27,000 kilo, uh, kilometers per hour. So um, I had this idea that I definitely want to take a photo of all these. But again, timing is crucial. They don't just occur. Sometimes when they are en route to the ISS, you need to keep on tracking how far they are, um, usually one or two days um, after launch, there is a way to track uh, on certain web, web pages. So the first one was the Cygnus spacecraft. You can see its distinctive uh, cylindrical solar panels. Obviously it's not going to be a, a beautiful space, but, but you definitely see the cylindrical shape of it and the two solar, solar arrays. Um, this, I didn't take this one. Um, also, there's a progress. I think everybody might be familiar with this spacecraft. This is a very old design. And I captured this en route to the International Space Station. Again, if you capture some good frames, then it means that you can make an animation out of it. And, and I always do, if I can, because it represents the object so much better. Now, Komojo, this is a fascinating topic, very recent. This is one of the largest modules, lately, just recently added to the International Space Station. It caused a lot of troubles. <laughs> it basically spent the International span, span? the International Space Station like almost twice, times and a half. So its, it's thrust has started and it, it caused all kinds of problems. But before it happened, we all knew and we were all waiting for this uh, module to, to go up. And on that night, uh, I've been waiting for it and it was a massive surprise. I expected two objects on that evening, namely the ISS and the Nauka module. The Nauka module took, I think, over a week, eight days, to approach the ISS and eventually dock to it. But this was a few hours after launch, so I knew that this was around 200, 200 and something kilometers above the Earth, and I knew, and I knew that, that it will come before the ISS. So I was waiting, and then a bright object appeared, and I started rolling, I started photographing, and when I finished, I was happy, I was really cheered up, and then I look up, and another object coming over. <laughs> okay, I started photographing the same thing, I almost missed it, and I waited, and another object came. <laughs> and I didn't really know what's going on. But then I realized that the first object was, if I remember well, this is the Proton Rocket uh, third stage. That was the surprise. First I thought that's going to be the Nauka module. Luckily, I looked up, because if I don't, then I miss the Nauka module. This is the Nauka module on the, on the right hand side. It has, a so it has a pair of solar panels, and it, it's, it's a large object. And then the ISS came. So this is how it looks like. And you can see even the, this docking area is nicely visible. So it was beyond my expectations. I was hoping, only hoping, that I'm going to get something similar to that. Again, if you have enough frames, then you can create an animation. And it suddenly it all comes alive. Uh, which is, again, I, I think I find it fascinating. Um, and then this is the um, Proton, proton uh, third stage. You can see this is the engine nozzle, and this is the cylind cylindrical bit, and the Nauka module was, was just attached to that part. Again, 
if you have enough frames, you can see he was tumbling. So he was just spinning slowly. And I was imaging, I had enough frames to actually see, to identify uh, the little engine nozzle, and, it's, and you can see that the dynamics of it, it's, it's, it's spinning. A few days later, more than a week later, to be precise, um, finally the NOCOM module arrived to the International Space Station. This is it. You can see it's a large module and, and I think it was a perfect story because this is by far the biggest thing I witnessed. I completely missed the whole construction of the International Space Station. I haven't seen any um, space shuttles flying, none of these things happened in my lifetime, or at least uh, since I pay attention to it. Probably another exa uh, exciting photographic topic related to the ISS is a so-called transit event. It means that the ISS is, can be observed in front of certain celestial, uh, celestial objects. It can be observed in front of the moon, in front of the sun, and in front of planets. In this case, this is planet Venus, and it happened about two hours after sunrise, and it means that you need to be at certain location. If you are a little bit, especially with, with, with planets, planets has a very small size, uh, apparent size, so it means that you need to be precisely at a certain location. It's a path. If you're a little bit outside of that path, this is going to happen. <laughs> so it's not going to be in front of the actual target. But these days, I'm less and less uh, keen on having it uh, in front of the planet, because it means that you can make a composition where there is the topic, so your, your planet, and obviously the ISS. Uh, even with low magnification, this, this, this photo was taken in prime focus, so there was no um, focal extender was used for this uh, imaging session. And still, you can see the, the solar arrays and certain modules, so it's all down to atmospheric conditions, I reckon. This one is, for instance, a Dragon spacecraft quietly following the International Space Station and that's in front of the sun. Uh, and this was taken with, this is this is one of the exceptions. I used to have a 127 Maxitov telescope, which I loved. It's such a capable telescope. And uh, I didn't see that when it happened. I just, I saw the ISS and that's it. And I had to really post-process uh, the images to actually spot the little um, dragon spacecraft just crawling after the International Space Station. Also, one of the prominent things can be uh, lunar transit. So basically, the moon is large enough, so you have a really wide path you need to be within to see it basically appearing in front of it. I always emphasize that post-processing is just as important as the imaging itself. It's, it's almost totally identical to planetary photography. So what happens is, you need to do a really good job down in the field when you're out there, but that's just your basics. You need to really dig out the useful information from your raw data, because otherwise it's just not aesthetically pleasing. And of course, uh, I got some new ideas, whilst you basically just crop the ISS in every single frame and then just put them together so instead of the instead of the ISS so the, the moon is fixed and the ISS is moving the ISS is fixed and the moon is moving behind as the time was passing by I kind of tried to master this imaging uh, this is now in color and so you can see I purposefully tried to find a location where it's not in the middle of the moon, like in the center line, but instead I, it wasn't 100% like I wanted, but I, my, in my head the idea was that it's just touching a little bit of the lunar surface 
and then entering and exiting basically. It just looks cool because if it's if it's always in front of the moon, it tends to blend into the moon surface because they are sort of the same brightness, and I just don't find it challenging. And then if I apply the same rule again to it, then suddenly the ISS is fixed, and then you see the whole perspective changes. But it's a totally new experience, basically, because you see the ISS, and then the moon moves behind it. And obviously, some people on Twitter told me that and said that it's fake. There's no way you could you could uh, actually follow the ISS this accurately. And I said, you, you're right and wrong. <laughs> it's you can call it fakery, but it's 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 real imagery. At the end of the day, we just change the whole dynamics of the event. And this was my birthday gift last year in March. I went to Chiswick, because that was the um, center line. This was even shared on Twitter by um, Commander Chris Hetfield, astronaut, which was a, a massive privilege to me. I mean, for me, there's no, no bigger compliment than an astronaut who actually was the commander of the ISS sharing my work. And, and everything was perfect, like everything. The atmospheric conditions, it was clear, it was a... Uh, the moon was really high, it was around 60 degrees above the horizon. Uh, the ISS was perfectly illuminated. Luckily, the experience uh, played a good role here. I could, I could use my previous experience, and that was the result. And I did eventually this animation. Again, I, I, I don't know how, I can't tell you how pleasing it is when you actually prepare for something for days or weeks because you see in the in, in the forecast that there will be a 60 degree pass and it will be right in front of the moon and you don't need to travel 100 miles away from your home it was relatively close um, and just everything came together really pleasing I have to say um, and I think my final event is a little bit related to Team Peak. This photo you will see, this was taken with a 90 millimeter Maxitov. It's about this big. It's a tiny telescope. And I was in a sort of an experimental phase in that time when Team Peak was spending his time on the ISS. That was his first trip. Hopefully soon you're gonna go up again. And you can notice on the photographs that one half of the solar panel is brighter than the rest. And this was uh, due to a mechanical failure. And one part of the, the um, solar panel wasn't moving the way than the rest. And it's kind of sticking out. And it was more illuminated than the others. So Team Peak teamed up with an American astronaut called uh, Tim Copra, so the two teams sort of conquered the space and they went out to, to basically fix this issue. And I happened to photograph it then, when the issue was ongoing, and then a little bit later, with a different telescope, I took the photo on the left after the repair. So basically, they went out, they, they photographed, sorry, they fixed it and I managed to photograph show you this photograph is because you can really see that ISS is not just live and alive <laughs> but it's, it's it's a dynamic thing and it's ever-changing you can you can really spot spacecrafts here and there coming and going spending some time sometimes when they move around things with the Canada arm that robotic arm this is all photographable and you really don't need uh, a, a, a huge investment uh, for this kind of photographs. If you like what you saw, you can visit my website. You can I, I read about these topics, and on my website, I dedicated it not just to my photographs, but I dedicated in general to ISS photography because I wanted to create it a hub. Uh, I know that a lot of people just don't know where to turn if they have this interest. Uh, I know because I was in the same position. I didn't know where to start. I had to take 
um, multiple occasions, uh, flybys, to experiment out the settings, your exposure time, your ISO, you know, how to, how to, what's the best way to track the ISS, what equipment you should buy. I made my own mistakes, many of them, <laughs> but I always said to everybody, there is no wasted imaging session because every time you can get away with, with some, some, some cool experience which you might use in the future. And I think just like again with, like with astrophotography, all these experiences are coming to play when there is something important happening and you don't want to mess up. You don't want to forget to take the backing off mask off or <laughs> happen to me. Or you push up your ISO because you just want to make double check that your focus is good enough and you don't put it back, happen to me. Um, or I can go on, <laughs> on these faults, how many of these things happened in the past. Again, my website is spacestationguys.com. I share other people's photographs as well, all around the world with all kinds of equipments. I can guarantee you, if you go onto the website and you click on the guest photos, you will see some photographs It really truly going to blow your mind. I mean, some people, what they do, your gut feeling going to say that this is fake. This can't be real because it's so clear. Um, robotic, so motorized mounts are able to track the ISS and some of the guys in the world, in America, there's a guy, there's another guy in Israel, all kinds of people doing this and they just took it to a, a brand new level. Seriously, it just, it's going to blow your mind. So I can guarantee you um, if you visit the website, also I talk about the techniques I share my experiences, so if you are interested in International Space Station Photography, hopefully this is the site to visit. And thank you very much for your attention, and, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you have any. I try to leave some time for it, hopefully. I'm really, I'm really looking forward uh, photographing the Starship. So, if if somebody is not familiar, uh, SpaceX is building a massive, gigantic rocket in uh, a so-called star base in Boca Chica, and that's going to be bigger than the Saturn V. It's going to be twice as powerful, and it's going to be 100 percent reusable, and. I don't know when is it going to fly, uh, hopefully this year it will do one, but we, we, we're still going to fly above us, but it's definitely on my list to, to capture that, because that, that's going to be a big, a big thing, I think. Hopefully that's going to help us become a interplanetary species, so it's really on my list, yes. And what about the Hubble Space Telescope? Oh, you mean the existing ones? Yeah. Um, the problem is that, it's okay, so I would like to photograph the Chinese space station. It's growing and it's beautiful. Some people are already taking photos. Sadly, it's really low from Britain. I think the highest elevation is probably 20, 24 degrees. That's way too low. Hubble, not even observable, but yeah, of course. <laughs> Both. <laughs> if I if I, if I would have the chance, and if I could go to a place, and if I could have a ten-inch scope <laughs> with me, definitely I would give it a try. Yes. yes. So where would you have to go to image the Chinese uh, space station at Carson Overhead? I uh, I think it's if I remember well, it's forty or forty degree, forty-five. I think forty degrees on both directions from the equator. That's the sort of 
line or the area. So maybe I think even 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 the Canary Islands not good for that. And Hubble Hubble is again the <coughs> same story almost. Maybe the Chinese space station I could get from Spain or Portugal, but the Hubble you need to go even lower. I think closer to the equator. If any of you online want to ask a question, put it into yes, the chat uh, box. One of the things about the international space station, I think the tilt of that is 51 and a half degrees. Yeah. That means if you're on the cusp... You mean the inclination? The, 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 the tilt, of it, it's always set at an angle of 51 and a half degrees. So if you're on the cusp on the sine wave, or the top or the bottom, you get a maximum number of passes. London is the main city of 51 and a half degrees. So the international space station... London's the best city in the world to see it, and it can pass directly overhead on the zenith. Yep, that's true. I love it, I love that's it. That's true, that's true. <laughs> I always keep telling to people, even by naked eye, you know, you knowing that, I mean, sometimes there are like ten of them uh, up there, and, and there is always somebody, you know, it's, it's habited, there are humans up there, and it's fantastic, probably, they just look down upon us. <laughs> Take every opportunity to observe it. Only twice I've seen it. I've sometimes seen a brilliant flash because the solar panels have just caught the sun at the right angle. Yep. You suddenly get this bright flash. Yep. Just take, blow your mind. Yeah. Yep. It's photographable. <laughs> some, sometimes some of us are actually taking photos of, let's say, one half of the solar panel just boop, suddenly yeah. just brightens up and it's a big flare. Even by naked eye, you can see. Yes. Yeah, it's so cool. Yes, over here, just uh, down on the floor. So, uh, when you're when are you tracking it, yeah. uh, how do you keep it in view? Do you use the tail rod or...? Yeah, so I look through the tail rod, and but that's... you just keep it centered in the tail rod all the way? I try to keep it centered. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, it's, it, so the... I think Martin uh, suggested me to put it... Uh, to put something underneath, because it's... So, it's, it's a conventional off-the-shelf Skywatch uh, Dobsonian telescope, so it's kind of this low, so you will see me sort of, uh, you know, and, and as it gets higher, it means I need to almost get on my knees, and, and it's just an awkward way to turn. If I would probably elevate it a bit, it means I don't need to bend that much, and it would probably help tracking as well, but it's, it's not easy because, because it's slow at the rise, and it's getting really fast, moving all the way to the highest point, and then it starts slowing down. Yeah. Out of curiosity, I mean, your camera is it like flat on the optical tube, or do you have an extension? No, no, no. It's on the on the on the on. So I glued it, you on know, the the, the base on so you onto the like tube. An extension, which makes it a bit higher, so no, you don't have to squat that much. No, 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 no. But what I'm thinking lately is that probably I would be better off if I would design some sort of uh, camera system with a little display. So just a tiny camera, and then probably I don't need to, because with the tower, the problem is that you need to look always from the, from the same angle. Uh, I've got one, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then you know what I'm talking yeah. about. If, if, if you don't look from this angle, but you look a slightly more inwards, yeah. that the center, where you center the ISIS, is not exactly there. So this is how I could probably overcome by need some some DIY, which I'm not really good at. <laughs> it's also possible for people on the Zoom call to ask questions, and Stuart is monitoring those. Have you got any questions on the Zoom? Yes, two questions, and the first is from... Oh, they're off the screen now. But the first question was, are you intending to uh, image the James Webb telescope when eventually it is launched? The question is, is he intending to image the James Webb tel Space Telescope, which should be launched later this year? Mm. Um, I, I don't think we can. That's my gut feeling, because it's, it will be launched from uh, cool French Guyana, and that's not really good for us. Usually what happens with launches from Cape Canaveral is that the ISS is coming always from west to east, so it means that the launching after or in front of the ISS, basically, but it's always heading towards us. And I know after 21 or 20, 21, 22 minutes, whatever they launch, that's how long it takes with the Falcon 9 rocket. But I think with uh, from Kourou, 
it's more like a sort of polar launch, and I don't think it will it will pass above us. And once it's going to a Lagrange point, so it's, it's going to be too far. So either then, but I don't think it will be photographable. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question was, how does the orientation of the ISS change during orbit, or is it static to relative to the Earth's surface? Um, mm -hmm. But before you answer that question, now I'll just say why uh, some people online were hearing me clicking away at my computer, because I was looking for an Excel spreadsheet that I'd done some time ago, where I estimated the drag on the International Space Station for it to drop its orbit at that rate. And it turns out to be very small, only about a couple of well, a fraction of a newton. Uh, the calculation I did was for, I think, 100 meters in a couple of weeks, and um, 0.2 of a newton is equivalent to about two one-pound coins. So that's the magnitude of the frictional drag. It seems very little, 0.2 of a newton, but then that is applied over 8,000 meters every, uh, every second, and that amounts to about 1,600 watts of energy per second. So wow. the amount of heat generated is 1,600 watts, and that causes it to decline at the rate that it does, which you can see actually on heavensabove.com. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I've, I've, I've answered a different the question, question, but the question was how the inclination changes. The inclination of the ISS with respect to the Earth's surface, does it change? I don't think that the inclination changes. It's always the inclination is the is the angle, based so as 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 the ISS is is orbiting that 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 angle that it sort of covers from the equator, and I think it's fifty one point six, I think. So that's always fixed. Well, is the question? The, I think is the orientation. Is the question, one. Do we always see the same side of the ISS? It's a very, very good question. Um, usually we do. So there is. So I mentioned that there is a, a nadir and a zenith side of the ISS. And there is always one side where, let's say, the cupola is, which has, I think, six or seven windows. Um, that's a facility you can get in and you can see the whole Earth. That's always facing downwards. So that's the nadir side. And then there is the zenith side, where, where again, it's always faces, sorry, uh, faces to the space. So the ISS is always turning like that. But to keep the ISS this way, it has four gyroscopes. So it means that they have to actually work on it, because otherwise things are just going to float around like this, instead of keeping in a certain orientation. But the orientation might change when there is a new... Um, spacecraft, or let's say a new module like the Nauka module arrives. So they basically what they did. I have this photograph. If you don't mind, I quickly go back. Um, you will see that the ISS on this photograph. It's oops. The screen sharing has stopped. I think we stopped sharing the screen. So on the ISS, I think this was it. So on this photo. Basically, the ISS is, is in a weird, so it's like 90 degrees out of orbit, so out of orientation. So what, the, what happens usually, this is the international segment, American, European, and um, uh, Japanese. So this is always facing forward. So if the ISS is going around the Earth, that section faces forward and the Russian segment is backwards. But because the Nauka module was coming, and they were preparing for it, they tilted basically the ISS 90 degrees. Because the Nauka module can easily dock this way, instead of they have to do certain maneuvers with the Nauka module. And before the Nauka arrived, actually they tilted 180 degrees. And I remember I, I saw my photographs and I was like, hold on for a second, this is something is wrong. Once you're familiar with it, you can spot that it's not facing the same way as usually. And then I realized that it was reversed, basically. It's, it's really interesting. Any other questions from the hall? Yeah, right at the back. Any other questions? What um, capture software do you use? Stacking software, noise software? Or mm -hmm. is it all on your website? 
What software is being used? It's a very good question. Uh, it's on the website, but I'm more than happy to, to tell you. So what I usually do is I record a video, uh, a few gigabytes long uh, video, and first you need to break it down into separate frames. So for that, uh, I use I only use softwares which used for planetary photography. So to break it down, I use PIPP. Probably some of you are familiar. That's why that's what it's called PIPP. Um, and there is a feature in that that it breaks down into T T TIFF TIFF files. And then once I have that, I use um, Lightroom, Adobe Lightroom. And then I batch process these photographs, and then I put them together in in I don't know in Photoshop or there is a website called EasyGIF.com or whatever website you use or software uh, for stacking, uh, which I don't really do do a lot. Occasionally, if I have really um, right after each other consecutive frames and, and the orientation doesn't change too much then I do stack with auto stacker again something that 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 used in planetary photography so PIPP auto stacker Lightroom these are my best friends for this process uh, yes Martin do you ever listen to radio transmissions not, not just, not you just for interest, radio but also, from the of course, ISS. you can hear those over the horizon, and you can tell, you can surmise a lot from uh, Doppler shift. I know that some people do. I, I don't, but but I know it's fascinating. Um, I watch the TV, <laughs> but I don't listen to them. <laughs> but in NASA TV, sometimes you can catch some conversation. I think. But, but I heard of that, that, that you can... Is it a ham, ham radio? Yeah, yeah they're yes. ham radio transmissions. Yeah, but yeah. There, there's always Doppler shift, and, yeah. and I think that, that could be used to... Some of my friends, they download photos, because sometimes with these radio signals, they include photographs, and you can put them together at home, and it's like a low-resolution... Yes, slow scan television, it's called. There you go. <laughs> So that's, but, but I don't, no, 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 this is my, photography is my main, main profile. Anything else you want to ask about? Right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. to finish back to having talks from external speakers. I wouldn't go that far. Thank you. Right, well, thank you. We'll press on now. Uh, we, Stuart has been beavering away, Stuart Court has been beavering away, engineering the live Zoom broadcast. This is the first time we've ever attempted this from a Wallace meeting, and actually it seems to be quite successful. We've actually got uh, about 17 people online, and in addition we've got about 35 people in the hall. So uh, about six, about, about, about fi at least well, 50, 60 people in total. So it's, it's quite a big meeting, actually. And hopefully the people online now can see the, uh, the observations, or something of them. That's the next slide. We've uh, had uh, Venus has had an apparition in the evening. It's been near greatest eastern elongation. And here's a picture I took on the 31st of October, on Halloween's night. And I quite like this picture because the lights of this house look a bit like a, a skull or something, a, a, an illuminated uh, pumpkin. So there's Venus, very low, uh, because Venus is in the summer constellations at the moment. It's in Sagittarius, so it's low down in the south of the sky and even though it's near its maximum distance from the sun it's about 40 degrees from the sun it's still very low in the northwest and uh, Steve Latham also managed to image uh, Venus more recently 7th of November that's yesterday with the very young crescent moon so Venus is up on the mid left of the picture and there's the 
moon only a couple of days old. Lovely picture there from Sue. And there's a more of a close-up of the moon yesterday. And we've had quite a lot of clear nights, I think, recently. I mean, the, the sky maybe has not been perfectly clear, but we've had a lot of clear weather. And there's also been a comet in the sky, and uh, I made a joke about this when I, when we had the BAA AGM, British Astronomical Association, a couple of weeks ago. They decided to make me president of the BAA, <laughs> and I counted up the number of presidents that have, there have been since 1890, when the association was founded. There's been 66. So I am the 67th president of the BAA, so I am 67P. And this comet is Comet 67P, which has the name, which is most difficult to pronounce of all comets, is Comet churyumov gerasimenko Yes, and uh, I've been practicing that one. Can we have that again? <laughs> no. So... <laughs> Uh, it's a famous comet because, of course, it was visited by the Rosetta probe a few years ago. So it's the comet that we know most about. And we've even landed the Philae lander on the surface. And here it is back this year. It's very close to the Earth at the moment. It's about 0.4 AU from the Earth. Very well placed in the sky, very high up in the constellation of Gemini. So it's rising just after sunset and it's very high in the early hours of the morning. And this was a, quite a short exposure. Uh, this was um, a, a, a stack of six two-minute exposures with a small telescope, a 66 millimeter telescope, and a black and white CCD camera, which actually doesn't belong to me. It was given to the BAA and it'll be put on sale soon because I can't afford it, it's a very expensive camera. Uh, and um, the comet is quite faint, it's magnitude nine and a half, so I don't think you'd be able to see it visually from the London area, even with a large telescope. Somebody might be able to prove me wrong, but probably not in our skies. But from a countryside sky, you would be able to see it visually. So that's Comet 67. Where, where is it on there? So I can't ah, you can't even see it at all. It is in the middle, bang in the middle. And oh, it's got a tail extending to the right. Yeah. Oh, Jupiter, of course, is still very well placed in the sky. Uh, here's some images. These are back from September the 11th that I took of Jupiter with a red, green and blue image in the middle and uh, an infrared image up the far left. And the image on the right is a combination of the two. So there's quite a lot of white spots in the southern hemisphere visible here. And I've had some more recent Oh yeah, this here's a slightly more recent one. Jupiter's well past opposition now. It's getting smaller in our telescopes. But here was quite an interesting occasion on November the 1st when there was a moon. This is actually Europa, and it's just visible on the far right of the planet as this bright patch. It's particularly bright in infrared. And the black splodge on the left of the planet, that's the shadow of Europa. So because the sun is uh, a quite an a, a inclined angle now to Jupiter. It's not shining from the direction of the Earth, but somewhere off. The shadow of Europa is a long way from Europa's appearance actually over the planet. And that was uh, quite recent, November the 1st, and that was again with my 14 inch telescope. I've had some uh, images of Jupiter from Lee, some nice images. And here you see the Great Red Spot is just rising on. on um, on the right hand limb there, and he's got some nice dark barges in the north equatorial area. And that's taken with Lee's 9.25 inch SCT from Ryslip and with a, a ZWO uh, 120MC camera. And then there's a couple of uh, little moons in there as well. That's Io and Europa. And here's another one. Uh, this is uh, 27th of August from Lee. And uh, it's, uh, he took nine videos and he's processed them together and taken the best 370 frames out of about 3,000. And there the GRS is 
getting a bit more on the disc there. So that uh, shows freight and there, there's a bit more further round and uh, that's three four minute videos and best 350 frames he's processed there. And it says all the different softwares he's used there as well, in case you're interested. So well done with that. Uh, more Jupiter, as usual, from Martin Lewis with his 444mm Dobsonian, 17th of October. These are the other way up. Martin has cho chosen the traditional convention of having south up. It's very hot in here, isn't it? I, d I don't know why they've got so much heating on here. Uh, if you're on Zoom, then you won't have this problem. But it's really <laughs> baking in here. And there's a radiator just here, which I've been trying to turn off with completely without success. So, uh, but on Jupiter, it's quite cold, of course. <laughs> and uh, lots of nice, nice little white spots there in the uh, southern, polar, southern temperate latitudes. And uh, quite, quite an inter interesting outbreak of activity just uh, to the right of the red spot, 17th of October, uh, 1st of November, is that a moon there, or that, is that a white spot? Yeah, that's Europa. That's Europa, that little white spot on the left hand limb. And Jupiter has this lovely orange tint, nice even in a small telescope. And Martin is using for these an ASI 224 colour camera and a dispersion corrector. And he's taken several videos and derotated them. And this is a methane band image. This is a special filter which passes a narrow wavelength of red light in the methane band. And this shows a different perspective on Jupiter. This shows the high altitude cloud features uh, look bright in methane, so you can see that the equatorial zone cloud features look particularly bright, and there's a, a shadow of a moon there, and the moon itself on the left-hand side. Is that the same one again? Is that, that's Europa. That's, that's the same occasion, more or less, that uh, I showed you, but, uh, yeah, a bit later, apparently. And also the... Um, the equatorial zone is bright in, in methane. Not the equatorial zone, the polar, the north pole, no, the south pole is bright in methane. And the north, where both poles are. And here's Saturn, taken again by Martin with his uh, 18 and a half inch home built Dobsonian, which must be one of the best telescopes imaging planets around, really, at the moment. Saturn is, of course, very low in our sky this year, so this is really an amazingly good result, considering that Saturn only gets to about 17 degrees above the horizon at best. That's 17th of October. And moving further out into the solar system, Neptune, well placed at the moment. This is Neptune and its largest moon, Triton, on the 1st of November. Neptune doesn't really show any details, or hard, it's very difficult to pick out any details, but it's, it's a bluish disk. And this is, uh, I imagine this is a, an infrared filtered image. Yeah, yeah. 610 nanometers, which um, has the best chance of showing any contrasts. Yeah, no features at all on there. But we don't think there are any features no. visible there. But it's always worth looking. Kwong Man has been doing some deep sky imaging with his Canon 100D camera, which is astro-modified, which means it's had its internal filter changed or removed uh, so that it doesn't block out the hydrogen alpha radiation in the far red. And this is a monochrome image, uh, and he's taken this without a telescope. This is taken with a 50 millimeter focal length lens, f2.5, and this is the result of stacking 20 90-second exposures. And it's tracked on a tracking mount. And this is Cygnus. And this is the North American Nebula, which is near the top end of Cygnus, near the, the head end of the cross of Cygnus. And lots of other nebulosity there. The whole area, and of course it's a very rich area. The Milky Way flows through this area. 
this, this air, other area to the right of the North American Nebula is known as the Pelican Nebula. You can't see North America, you can't really, because this is so, so much, but this is the Gulf of Mexico, and this is Mexico, this bit, and this is Canada. Doesn't look that much like North America in reality. And you can see from this picture, actually, that it's all one nebula, really. It's all a huge complex of nebulosity across this region. And then this gap between the North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula, this is actually a dark area. This is a dark molecular cloud, which is between us and that, uh, that emitting area that's blocking out some. And you can see other areas where the stars are sort of more, more absent. And you can see where that there's, that's where the molecular clouds are. So it's a fascinating or mixed up area of star birth and, and different clouds in that area of the sky. And here's another one from Kuang Man, another famous area of the sky. This is the area in Orion, near the belt of Orion. And the brightest star in this image is actually Alnitak, which is the left-hand end of the belt of Orion. And uh, this is, that's another of the stars in Orion's belt on the far left of the image. And you've got the Horsehead Nebula there, which is another dark molecular cloud which is silhouetted against the bright hydrogen alpha emitting region behind. And this other, this more frilly area of nebulosity here, that is known as the Flame Nebula. And he took that on November the 7th, so only a couple of nights ago. He stayed up all night to do it, he tells me. He was up until 6 a.m. imaging. So there's dedication for you with a 17 millimeter refractor, and the Canon 100D camera and a seven nanometer band pass hydrogen alpha filter, and that's 43 minute exposures. I showed you this last month, but I've added some more exposures to it. This is the Heart Nebula, another hydrogen alpha emitting nebula, and this is taken with the same setup that I used to image that comet. This is the Hart Nebula in Cassiopeia, IC1805, and this was taken with the 60 millimeter telescope and the hydrogen alpha filter and the QSI 6120 CCD camera. So you maybe can see the heart shape, but you can't quite get the whole thing. It's a very big thing, and this, this field of view is probably about three or four degrees wide. So if you saw the moon on the same scale, the moon would be quite small. The moon would be maybe the size of my hand, something like that on the, on the screen. So it's quite a big area of the sky. And there's, again, in the Cassiopeia area, there's lots of these hydrogen alpha nebulosities, which you, you can't see visually from the London area. You'd be challenged to see them from, you may, you probably would see them, especially with a filter from a very dark place like the south of France, but, uh, or the north of Scotland, but uh, certainly not in England. But you can image them, and this is uh, 28 two-minute exposures with a tracking mount, but it's not auto-guided. Uh, so each uh, two-minute exposure is stacked on the next two-minute exposure. The, 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 there's no correction between them, so there is a little bit of drift. And this is an amazing picture, isn't it? And we haven't had a contribution from this um, contributor before. This is Dr. Chris Crow, And Dr. Crow is actually a teacher at Harrow School. So just a stone's throw from this meeting place. And he is, he teach, he's the head of astronomy and I think it's computer science, something like that. So he teaches various subjects there. And he's also got a club, an astronomy club at the school. And that's what he's doing tonight. That's why he isn't here tonight, or isn't watching tonight, because he's doing his astronomy club at Harrow School. And he took this picture with a telescope, which is not in this area. It is actually in Mustique, which is in the Caribbean. And it's a big telescope, 24-inch telescope and it's got a, a CCD camera on it, and this is six hours exposure. The object is called the Rosette Nebula. It's in Monoceros, which is a winter constellation just to the left of Orion, and the Rosette Nebula is actually, there's actually a star cluster here, and these stars 
have produced, uh, young hot stars which have produced lots of solar winds which have pushed a cavity in this gas and created this donut shape and you can see all this detailed structure. This is all areas where new stars are condensing out from this nebulosity and these different colours are due to the shock waves produced by the winds from these stars and this is taken with um, uh, narrow band filters and it's a false colour image. It isn't really this colour, it's really red. Uh, and he's, but he's used uh, what's called the Hubble com palette or the Hubble combination of colours where he's used the hydrogen alpha signal as green or, or blue and um, uh, silicon 3 as, as the red signal. So it's a, it's a false colour image. And he's also sent me, <coughs> Dr Crow has also sent me this picture and this is him relaxing against the walls of this observatory and he informs me that he built this observatory with a team of architects for a client. So I don't think it's got anything to do with the school. I don't think they own it. It's somebody else owns it. Uh, but obviously this is uh, a composite image. He's combined uh, an image of the observatory and himself and an image of the night sky. So that's the Mustique Observatory and that's Dr Crow. I'll say a little bit about what's coming up in the sky. I mentioned Venus is still visible in the evening sky and it's actually attaining its peak altitude at sunset uh, in December. So it's not there yet, although it's had its greatest elongation uh, because of the way the sun is moving. Uh, Venus is actually getting slightly better placed in the winter sky. So if you've got a good high vantage point, uh, first floor window or something like that and can look to the uh, west or south-southwest it's, uh, it's worth looking out for Venus just after sunset and it's very bright it's going to be minus 4.7 magnitude 4, minus 4.7 a maximum and when it's at its brightest in December it will be a thin, a thin crescent if you can get a telescope on it and you may be even be able to see that crescent with good binoculars because it will be a big thin crescent. We're coming up to first quarter moon soon uh, November the 19th is the next full moon and there is a lunar eclipse but it's not hardly visible from this area unfortunately and uh, November the 27th will be a very high last quarter moon, so that will be a good moon to observe in the early morning sky. And uh, December 4th, a new moon, and as usual, a month after a lunar eclipse, we've got a solar eclipse. Unfortunately, that won't be seen by many people. The, part, the lunar eclipse is actually a good lunar eclipse from some parts of the world. The moon actually passes almost totally into the shadow of the Earth, uh, but this is the area where the eclipse is visible. It's be very well visible in North America and South America and Eastern Russia. So we may well see some interesting pictures of that on November the 19th from other parts of the world. But from London, you see, we're just on the edge of the zone of visibility. I think it's going to be too low to see. And even if you can see the moon at that time, what time is it? The, the, the time of the start of the eclipse is um, can't quite make it out from here. But uh, we, it, it uh, yeah, it's, it's morning. It, it occurs in the morning. The start of the eclipse occurs at six in the morning, six o two in the morning. So if you can see the moon at that time, it will only just be entering the Earth's shadow. So it'll be very difficult to see anything actually happening before it sets. And then the total solar eclipse on December the 4th will be witnessed by penguins. And they will no doubt send their reports back <laughs> to us. So it's, uh, this is the track of the eclipse over the Antarctic. I think some people are intending to travel there by boat. So Saturn and Jupiter are still nicely in the evening sky. Here they are. Uh, Saturn is due south at 5.30 in the evening, 19 degrees high, and Jupiter is following it round uh, about an hour later, a little bit higher. And on the 11th, for which this chart is drawn, we'll have the moon nicely close to Jupiter, 
just below Jupiter, just south of it, about four degrees away, on the 11th. Uh, minor planet, new series, is uh, in Taurus, it's, uh, near the Hyades star cluster, and it's at opposition on 27th of November. Magnitude 8, so it's a, a binocular object, this series, binocular object, or small telescope, very high in the sky, quite near Uranus. Uranus has passed opposition now. It's, it's transiting in the late evening, 23.30. It's uh, visible in binoculars or a small telescope, 53 degrees high. It's a good opportunity to look at Uranus. You'll need a telescope with high magnification to actually see it as a planet. I think you need probably 200 times magnification before you can see that little green disk as a definite circle of light. Uh, probably you won't see any details on it, but it's, it's a good, uh, it's well placed in the sky. So have a look for Uranus. And Neptune as well is well placed. It's in the slightly earlier, transiting at 8 p.m., a much fainter, 33 degrees high, and even smaller. So there's a comet, Churub of Gerasimenko again. I actually took that in the early hours of this morning. This was 0304 to 0337 this morning. The stars look trailed because I've stacked the images on the comet, and there's a little bit of a tail there. So it's in Gemini, and it's at its brightest it brighter than it will be for another 20 years. It has quite an eccentric orbit, so usually it passes the Earth further out, but it's currently between, more or less between the Earth and the orbit of Mars. There's another comet in the sky. This is not my image. This is from Peter Carson, who takes images from Essex. Uh, but I mentioned Comet Leonard, uh, 2021A, one, because it could become bright. It could become a ma naked eye comet in mid-December. It's moving quite fast across the sky. It will be in the constellation of Ophiuchus by December, but it's one to look up and follow. It's very faint at the moment. It's 10.5, so that's even fainter than the other comet, 67p, but it could brighten up considerably. Uh, you can never exactly predict comets, they're often a damp squib when they're predicted to be bright, but it could become a naked eye comet. Comets, of course, uh, give rise to meteors. Meteors are just the dust left behind by comets in their orbit. And there's a couple of famous meteor showers coming up, the Leonid meteors, in early November, well, about now. Uh, but we've, um, we've, unfortunately, we've got moonlight and also, well, it's cloudy as well, obviously. And... Um, it's not predicted to be a very rich shower this year. The, meteor, the Leonids have given spectacular showers in some years, but it's not expected to be a, a spectacular one this year. Then moving into December, we've got the famous Geminids, which is the best shower of the year, maximum on December the 14th, which is just one day after the next Wallace meeting. And they will probably attain about 100 meteors an hour. So you, you won't see as many as that from London, but if you go to a dark site, as dark as you can manage, and you sit in a deck chair looking up, you, you stand a good chance of seeing something like one meteor every minute. Uh, and look in the constellation of Gemini, which will be more or less overhead at that time. Unfortunately, there's an interference from moonlight at that time, so it won't be the best year for observing the Geminids. That's all the slides I've got to show you. Oh no, I thought I'd show you because some of us in Wallace went to this place a few years ago. Uh, Trevor, who's here today, and uh, Howard, who's uh, another member, well known to many of you. Uh, Howard organized this trip to see the telescopes on La Palma. And of course, um, the telescopes on La Palma are up here on the top of this hardly extinct volcano, the really big telescopes, I mean like the, um, the biggest telescope in the world, the Grand Telescopio Canarius, and the British uh, William Herschel telescope, but uh, there's a volcano has gone off, and this is near to a, a guy I know in the um, BAA has this observatory, Paul Leyland, he, sent, he took this picture, 
and it's uncomfortably close. And in fact, there was another amateur observatory, really big amateur observatory, close to the volcano, which has sadly been totally destroyed by the flow of lava. Uh, that, that observatory had, I think, a, a half-meter telescope, and it's been totally destroyed. But uh, fortunately, Paul Leyland's is a couple of miles away from the volcano. This is not where we expected the volcano to go off. We expected the next one to go off at the southern end of the island, because that's where the last uh, eruption was in the 1970s. But in fact, this is more or less in the middle of the island. This volcano has gone off. And so they can't use the big telescopes at all. The big telescopes at the top of the, uh, top of the island in the observatory because um, it, of the ash and also earthquakes. So um, at least we, you may complain about all the clouds you get here and all the Starlink satellites that are spoiling your images, but which um, uh, Slobosh likes, um, uh, like, likes to take pictures of anyway. But uh, at least we don't have this kind of problem in Harrow. So with that, uh, I will uh, say thank you very much and ask, is, is there any other announcements that anybody can think of that we need to give? We I need to announce that we're not doing any public observing this autumn. We were thinking of doing public observing, but the committee have taken expert advice and decided that it's uh, still too risky for people to be sharing telescopes and getting close together. We can't really think of a way it could be done while maintaining social distancing. So we're not doing the public observing this year, although we will try and do an event with the Scouts, which uh, Stuart's trying to organise. That's so, actually going to be on the 7th of December. 7th of December. Yeah, so so um, I might be asking for help on that occasion. It's a Tuesday and they meet in Northwood. Right, so Tuesday, 7th of December, we will be, probably be looking for assistance with that event to help um, the Scouts and maybe do a bit of observing. So uh, thank you very much for everybody for coming. Thank you for our 20-ish uh, listeners and viewers on Zoom. Thank you particularly to, to Stuart for all the work and all the running around he's done and also to Tim Milton for monitoring the video and all the work that they've done in preparation, they came here about over an hour early to set up all the equipment and try and get it working, while um, others of us were, were enjoying ourselves in the, in the pub. So uh, thanks to them. Uh, it seems to work quite well. And uh, we'll, we'll um, see you all at the Uxbridge meeting place in December. And the speaker on that occasion will be Colin Wilson, who has spoken to the Society before. Very entertaining speaker. He will be talking about time and theories of time and how we understand time. Can you travel in time? Does time really exist? All kinds of deep questions like that. So that sounds like it will be great fun. So hope to see many of you there. Thank you very much.